I mean, <laughs> I'm going to say it, okay? Yeah. yeah. I'm going to say it. Goblin. I mean, yes. <laughs> Goblin. Come on. Nyang SAO, welcome to Afternoon of Delight, where Leah, Megan, and Amy, romance novelists, and your K romance guides. So grab some deck bokey and listen to your new favorite unease. Hey, everybody. Hello. Hi there. We're back together again. Again. Oh, yeah, I guess we were last week, weren't we? We were. For okay. See You in My 19th Life. Yes. Yeah, you're right. We were together last week. It's just almost like I wasn't there because <laughs> I didn't watch it. <laughs> That's why you forgot. Yeah. I remembered you. I do want to shout out a comment on our Instagram because uh, we've said that we like kind of wish we had the different name for like a hangover. Like, you know, when you watch a drama and you like it like affects you for like a long time. And um, we kind of wanted a different word for it. And someone said to call it the afterglow. And I think that is perfect. Absolutely. So I think now maybe we're going to say that we have a drama afterglow. It's just a little bit more positive. And that segues really nicely into the name of our network that we have created that we are. What? That was with. such a good segue. <laughs> yeah. So we are a full network now with four podcasts. We're not stopping at four. We have, we have an infinite amount of ideas, not just limited to podcasts. So yeah. But uh, yeah, so I kind of, I really like that. So thank you for that comment. We love it. We're taking it and running with it. Perfect. So can I tell you something I don't love? Yeah. Okay. So if you're at home, you can't really see this. But for the two of you, I know you can't see it that well. But if you look. I can't because you said it. Because you said it. I can see it now. So I have a big old thing on my face. And what I am. My best guess is what has happened is I think I have a spider bite on my cheek. Because this is not. These aren't zits. They aren't mosquito bites. They're not like an allergic reaction. They've been bit like they're bites. So I think while I was sleeping in the last like two nights, some little critter just like marched across my face and maybe I moved. I don't know what, but he just decided to crunch down on my cheek. Oh, well, you, know I what got... the, you know what the urban legend is about getting a spider bite in the middle of the night, right? I don't know that they like lay eggs in your oh. in your skin and you're gonna have little tiny baby spiders come out of your cheek <laughs> i thought you were gonna tell me that i'd have no worries for the rest of my days <laughs> no i'm sorry i thought you were gonna say it laid eggs it would it, it laid eggs in her ear no so that's why that's no think... more that's no more hakuna matata than in your face true i just i remember when i was a kid like people used to say like spiders lay eggs and lay eggs in your like they bite you and then they lay eggs in it or something like that i'm i'm obviously joking Mm -hmm. But just in case, just in case you do pop that sucker and little tiny baby spiders come out. Oh my out, God. I told you so. So it's not like, you don't think it's a mosquito? Like, why did you, no, I just no, am curious. mosquito -y about it. It's because it's like, it's too big to be a mosquito. There's two next to each other. Uh, Does it itch? No, but I've had bites in the past that are weird. I, I mean, look, I'm just operating on a theory here. Um <laughs> I'm going to say that I'm not really scared of spiders, so it's not something that's going to, like, really keep me up at night. Mm -hmm. We are, though, having an elevated level of spiders in our house, around our house. So I don't want to, I mean, we're coming into spooky season, so I'm not looking to, like, end it. And plus, I think spiders are my friends, and I like that they catch pesky bugs. Yeah. But if you were going by my house, you might start to be like, huh, because, like, there's about six very big webs and in the middle of each web is a very big spider right now and every day there's like a new web and a new big spider and i'm like is this the beginning of a horror movie where like you know the neighborhood house all of a sudden and now i've been bit by a spider oh my god i'm writing my own horror story you are and You're gonna like i'm gonna start spinning out my butthole and I'm going to just like cover the whole house and then I'm going to mutate into a giant spider. You're going to be like Jeff Goldblum in the fly. I'm just gonna <laughs> right. turn into this. So it's called it. So it's not like spider woman. She's going to turn into a spider. Yeah. Like full fledged. I'm trying to think. I don't have anything funny. Like nothing's popping out good, but I was like a rack. No, 
Well, there was a movie called Arachnophobia in the well, 90s. Yeah, I know that, but I was trying to think But of, I'm like, saying, like, it's, like, that's kind of what happens, that spiders took over. Like Arachno-ho? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Arach- I, Arachnanuna? 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 <laughs> Arachna- Arachna-uni? Uni? Arachna mama. <laughs> And all of a sudden, I just had like I just keep giving birth to these little spiders. I'm like my babies, my babies, and they're like and you're Arach- sm- you're Smeagol, and they're like and Arachna Oma, Arachna Oma. <laughs> I'm not gonna kill the neighbors. Yes, children, go kill them all. Go kill the neighbors. And the thing that's crazy is my own children, especially the girls, are fucking terrified of spiders, and I don't even know how they got it because like I don't model a very alarmed behavior with spiders, like. Certainly, if a spider is going to bite my face, I'm not going to be like, yes, just <laughs> take one for the road. But I don't have like a phobia like I do about other things. It depends on the size of the spider, my my fear of it, right? Like it's – so we – my bathroom is like the central bathroom for the upstairs. The, my kids just like to use my bathroom to shower and sometimes to use other parts of the bathroom. And we had – a tiny baby spider in a tiny baby web in the corner, like where the door frame meets, like where the shower is. And it was just there. And like, I spoke to the spider and I made a deal and I'm like, you stay there, you stay alive. Like that's all I really care about. Right. And I told my children about the spider and I said, look, I have a deal with the spider in the bathroom. (laughs) Like it's not just a contract. Right. There's a contract. (laughs) We shook, I shook all eight of its legs. (laughs) And we're we're not doing anything because it's just staying in its little web in its little corner and it's eating whatever tiny little microorganisms are are going in its web, and so we named it Fred. Um, and like the kids would check on Fred and like make Aww. sure Fred was still there. And when they went to their dad's for a couple of days, when they were you know at his place, all of a sudden one morning I woke up and I didn't see Fred anymore. Mind you, Fred's small. Right. right. I didn't see Fred anymore. And so I told him, I'm like, you guys, I'm sorry. I'm like, I, I promise you I didn't vacuum him up or anything. But like Fred's Fred's gone. Fred has mm-hmm. gone to a better place, maybe over the Rainbow Bridge. Who knows? We're a little bit sad about Fred. Then like two days later, either Fred or one of Fred's children are back because there's just all of a sudden. No... So I think it's just like Fred's family is just, you know, they we come, they in. stay for a little bit and then they take off. So yeah, that's our little spider corner. But so that's Fred and Fred two and Fred three and however many Freds there are. <laughs> but my daughter was in her room. I think she was homesick last week and she was in her room by herself. And I think I was at work and there was a spider crawling across her sheet, like while she's laying in her bed. And she's like, mom, this was not a small spider. She's like, and you weren't here. So I had to go to your room and get the dust buster <laughs> and go back to my room and dispose of the spider. So right. this dustbuster sitting right next to me right now. So that that spider's probably in there. So yeah, it is. It's a size thing because she's fine with Fred, but the spider in the bed's not a good idea. She's and she said it was larger. I didn't see it, so I don't know. Yeah, I know. When so we have like the orb weaver spiders that are uh, outside, or the, I think they're called like garden spiders sometimes. Um, but they're the ones who build the like round the very the round webs. Mm. And they usually build them in the morning uh, and then they catch things throughout the day and then they like eat the web at night and then they start the cycle over again. They build a new web and I love them. They're huge. They're really big spiders, Um, but I love them because they take care of mosquitoes. Like their webs are huge. Anything that takes care of mosquitoes, I am a huge fan of. I tell the kids, I'm like, they'll be like, there's a spider. And I'm like, don't you dare touch the orb weaver like i love the orb weaver spiders i mean at one point i think we had like three on our deck and i was like leave them <laughs> don't touch them because <laughs> yeah anything that kills mosquitoes is a plus in my book yep and agree lantern flies but you guys don't have them right i don't Either know what that you, is they don't ha- you don't have the infestation that happened on the east coast we have um the infestation of uh Lantern flies, which are not native. So they're an invasive species. That's like and stink bugs here. They're huge. They're awful. I hate them. But yep. anyway, I don't know how to segue from bugs. Well, here's, 
Okay, here's one last quick question, and then I've got a segue depending on how you go with it. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> Beyond spiders, what's something, and something random, what's something random you are phobic about? Um, the shower drain. That's not random. You've talked about that before. That's because of right. it. It's because of it. Yeah. Well, it feels random. Yeah, I mean, I guess, so, like, off the same token, I'd say, like, I, and my kids are like this, too, which is really funny, um, and it comes from, like, horror movies from when I was a kid. I, no matter how hot it is in my room, and it gets hot, I cannot sleep with, like, zero cover or sheet on top of me. Mm-hmm. Right, because something could mm-hmm. Something will get me. Yeah. Right, if I'm under the cover, if I'm under the blanket, Nothing I'm safe. That's totally valid. Same way. thing with like anything, any any limb dangling off the edge of the bed. No, <laughs> my absolutely Neil, not. Neil sleeps with his limbs dangling off the bed all the time, and he'll wake absolutely up. not. He wakes up with like random scratches and like yeah, from the clown under the from bed. The cat, no, from the cats. <laughs> they like come through and they just have like a little nibble on his hand, and then they like go away. And I'm like, put your limbs on the bed. Yeah, yeah no. he woke it's... up with like all these mystery scratches on his hand. Yeah, no, you don't. You're not dangle off the bed. No. <laughs> what about you, Leah? Um, I think I've talked in here before about water fountains. What? Um, I don't think so... you ever. <laughs> oh, maybe I. Have you mean not. like just from like a germ standpoint? No, not at all. Do you think I have a germ phobia? Not no, really. that's why I'm like I don't know why you'd be afraid of water fountains. <laughs> I have a phobia of someone smashing my face into the <gasps> water fountain when I'm getting a drink. Like That's grabbing awful. my hair and just shoving it into the drinking fountain. That is an intrusive thought if I ever <laughs> That is the <laughs> one. <laughs> yeah. it never happened to me. Like no one's even like threatened to do it. I just whenever I go to do it, I'm like, oh no, I'm just gonna like or sometimes if I really have to drink water and I don't have a water bottle and I have to use it, I tend to do something really elegant and not you know at all weird looking which is like splash it it as far away as i can like kind of like come in and do like quick like (laughs) quick swoop in in. water (laughs) i want to see you have the water going and you're just trying to splash it up into your mouth (laughs) or i just have to like be like don't do the thing don't be weird about it just drink the water from the water fountain like a person see i just think water fountains are gross yeah, that too. But like, I imagine my teeth like breaking Oof. off on, like the edge of like the <laughs> <laughs> oh, Leah. So violent about it, <laughs> which makes me obviously not feel super sunshiny. Right, it makes you grumpy. <sighs> to thread the needle, yes. <laughs> Let's go with that. Okay. <laughs> Because what are we talking about tonight? Well, tonight we're doing another trope study. So the last trope study we did was on forced proximity, and you guys really seem to like it, and we really like doing it. So well, I missed it, so I'm excited to do this one. I know. We really did miss you, because you totally would have loved it. And so today's trope study is on grumpy meets sunshine. Mm-hmm. So sometimes there are character traits that are so well loved that they transcend into their very own tropes. And that is definitely the case for the classic romance pairing of a grumpy and or cynical character meeting and falling for a bright, happy and often optimistic person. Think glass half full meets glass half empty. In shorthand, this is the grumpy meets sunshine trope, which we've referred to numerous times. And today we'll delve into it a little deeper and talk about which K-dramas do it well or not well, because that's what we do here. Last year, we released a podcast episode called Why We Love Sundere Characters. And if you haven't listened to that, go check it out. But if you want a brief synopsis, here it is. Sundry characters are described as cold on the outside and a warm, squishy marshmallow on the inside, especially and often only for the person they love. So we Nunas love a good Sundry character, and that's probably why this trope works so well for us, because a good grumpy character is often a Sundry. 
So, first of all, what is so appealing to all of us about the grumpy sunshine trope? And where does it rate in our ranking of favorite tropes? I think for me, it's one of those, like, fantasies to be the sunshine to somebody else's cloud. Like, I love the idea of a grumpy hero or heroine not budging for anyone except the love interest. And so, for me, I mean, you know, we talked about it with the Sundry episode, like, I gravitate towards this character, especially in a hero, right? Because I'm inserting myself in the place of the heroine and I want to be the one and only, you know, that makes Gu Jun Pyo stop bullying me or whatever. And I'm not talking about (laughs) that. It has to be, it doesn't have to be a bully fantasy, but yeah, I mean, like to, to have that, cause that's power, right? When you're, when you're the sunshine that can melt the grumpy iceberg. I love that. So yeah, it's, it's one of the top tropes for me. Yeah, I mean, it's all about, like, that you're the special one, right? So it's that fantasy that you're the special one, you're Mm -hmm. the only one that can crack that person's, like, icy heart, you know? And for me, it's top, top. Like, it truly is top, top. You really only have to tell me that it's, like, Grumpy Meet Sunshine, and nine times out of ten, I will watch it. Even if it's historical, <laughs> like, I will, you know, I will watch it because it, it truly is one of my one of my favorite tropes. Yeah. So for me, it's definitely one of my top tropes, too. It's usually a good uh, selling point. And I'm going to say that like last time when we did um, a trope talk and we talked about force proximity, this is one that really does to me generally need to it's going to do best with a layering of some kind. So that could be a layering of enemies to lovers. That could be a layering with force proximity. It could be a layering with, um, you know, friends to lovers too. But I think it does, it really brings out fun elements for, you know, another trope to layer it with the grumpy sunshine. And I think that part of what is really like the, the thing that keeps me coming back to romance when look, we know how it's going to end. We know it's going to end with a happily ever after. So when you already know roughly how the ending is going to happen, people are like, well, why are you invested? So why you're invested in some ways for me, what gets me is the fact that in real life and in fiction life, I get pretty fascinated with like the masks that people wear to protect themselves from emotional harm, how you kind of like, take your traumas and your vulnerabilities and you put on armor. And so that grumpiness often is that mask and that armor that you have. And so who are you going to be vulnerable for the person who's going to make it um, the, the person who's going to like, kind of like dismantle all your barriers because you're in love. And that's just, it's something that's fun to see over and over the different ways that that turns up in story. Yeah. Like the different ways that the sunshine character breaks through the mm-hmm. grumpy dark cloud like what are all the ways that that can happen that's all that I don't, it's like that's better to me than the hea that's what i'm there for i'm there for the journey right because you know the hea is coming so yeah. how you get there is the most fun exactly um so yeah so have you written a grumpy sunshine book so when i started thinking about this i was realizing that i I often make my heroes pretty grumpy because I just like them that way. Like, I I like to read this trope, I like to watch this trope, and I like to write this trope. But there's one in particular of my books, and it's an earlier book of mine from 2016 called Three Simple Words. And the heroine is a bookseller who loves romance novels and is thoroughly convinced she will one day find an HEA for herself, you know, like in a romance book. And she just believes in HEAs and HEAs are the best. And the hero, so talk about like layering tropes. The hero is her younger brother's best friend. So it's a new romance. Um, Hero is her younger brother's best friend who is now a best-selling author. And she hated his book because of how like bleak and anti like happily ever after it was. Um, And so there's that. So like, you know, she's totally attracted to him, super sexy, but she hates what he stands for in his writing. And he is super, a super grump about like happiness and romance. And so I I loved writing that one and I thought it was super fun. How do I not remember that one? Because 
when it comes to romance, like, man, we churn them out, like, every few yeah. months. So how do, how do we keep track? Like, just know, like you but... were talking about last week that you did a past lives one. And we were like, what? Uh, and that yeah. was one of your recent ones, too, that I didn't realize was a past lives. But that is such a cool premise <laughs> that he wrote a book and it's anti-HEA and she's a bookseller. Like, yeah. genius, dude. Yeah, I and he was it. coming to do, like, a book signing at her shop. And she was like, Mwah. I don't want, like, he doesn't, like. Yeah, he doesn't believe in all the sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> I uh, do. And yeah. She's like, boo, I'm not supporting this book signing. Yeah. Oh, that's great. I love it. Um, so I'm same as you. I So I would say this. This is my favorite trope. And part of it is because I don't think I'm the best at writing it. No matter how much I try to write a grumpy hero with a sunshine heroine, a lot of times I... I think I turn him into complete mush by the end. Like, I think mm-hmm. I almost go. I do, too. So 180 that it's, like, ridiculous. I just, I think it's, I actually do think this is hard to do. Mm. And so, I, but I attempt every, I swear to God, I think every single book I attempt to write it. But I think my favorite was uh, one of my alien books. It's called The Alien Savior. And this alien is heavily scarred um he has horns but like one of his horns is cracked and like half of it's missing which is like badass you know he's got this like cracked horn and he blames himself for like the death of his twin um just really heavily heavily burdened uh with guilt with pain from losing his family members and then he meets this like and he's really big he's like one of the biggest of this alien species that i have and he meets this heroine who is tiny and she's just very, very happy, like despite her like circumstance of being transported to an alien planet from Earth and almost taken captive as a sex slave, but saved at the last minute. She is. <laughs> she's super sunshine, super sunshine. And she's so sweet. And he is like obsessed with her, um, like obsessed with her. Um, he like spies on her. And she doesn't know it. And then he like, and then he feels like guilt that he like spied on her, you know, and he like, he's like very tor- like self torture. But anyway, um, but he ends up falling for her. And part of it is that she is like, sort of sort of reckless. And she's like willing to also like risk her safety for him. And like, no one's ever done that for him. He's always been the one to like risk himself for others. And she's super happy. And then they fall in love. And then he turns into a complete mush. And then they have twins twins cross species because he was a twin he lost his twin so then they you know it's genetic even in this alien species to have twins in the family so then they have twins twin twin little girls oh with horns uh the babies have like nubs they're, like <laughs> half human <laughs> I want to shout out, and this is not like me poking. I mean, I'm poking fun, but in like a loving way. You shared a book, so it's a. Fr- it must be a colleague of yours in like the monster verse writing world. Uh huh. It caught my eye, and I want to call it out, not to make fun of it, except to say that, like, look, there has to like do do people who write monster romance like you have a tongue in cheek about it, right? Like you know, it's kind of funny, right? I do. I mean, I think I'm. I would say ninety five percent of the authors do. Yes. Okay. We, we so, realize what we're writing. If I overstep, we can delete this. Okay. But I found it to be humorous, ridiculous, and yet I was like, well, damn, like, that's that's a choice. And it was a good one. That's what I, that's, if you read my books, that's what I would want you to think. Okay. So, Orcus Pocus. Oh, that was Ava. <laughs> yes. yeah, right, Ava Ross. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, she, she's, she's she fully knows. Park, and it's called Orcus Pocus. Pocus, yeah. So she's like, that's funny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and like, I felt like I'm like, this is meant to be funny, right? Like, you want this to be funny. Oh, yeah. She's actually really, she's pretty good at humor. And she like, yeah, she's trying to entertain. Yeah, because it like felt very, are. I mean, the cover, the whole thing looked like it was meaning to be funny. So I'm not yeah. trying to be like, oh, I saw it. Like, I saw it and I was like, I don't know. I just was like, that's ridiculous, but like in a funny way. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. 100%. She writes a bunch. She has Orky. Wait, what is it? It's like Orky Breaky Heart instead of Achy Breaky Heart. (laughs) Okay, this is this is amazing. And then there's another there's another I don't know if this is her book or someone else, but it's Gargoyles Just Want to Have Fun. 
like <laughs> she, she did like <laughs> monster i mean just yeah it, like i love it but yes i mean orcas book <laughs> i mean it's clearly... i was like it's, yeah i i'm glad it's in fun because it was funny to me absolutely and she honestly does a really good job writing like monster rom-coms that's essentially the niche she's writing and i think it's genius that's awesome <laughs> yeah so, look, I'm going to go back with this one to, like, the way, way back, but I wanted to do it. I'm going to bring this as an example for specific reasons. So I'm going to go to my very first series, which is off the map, uh, which is, like, very much a grumpy sunshine couple. And what I thought was funny about it is that when people were reading it, they were like, oh, this must really be, like, you and your husband. Like, I got that feedback kind of a lot. Like, it must be, like, you're all, like happy and sunshine your husband's like the grumpy one look do i think my husband's grumpy yes but what did i feel like i was basing this on him no in fact i really felt like it was myself and i felt like i was more the hero in that book than i was the heroine even though people kept like trying to like think i was like writing myself as the heroine because i am a pretty like pleasant person to many I mean, I don't know if many people think that. I, I think I'm pleasant, but I feel like I'm kind of grumpy in my, like, heart. <laughs> and so I felt like I was, like, working stuff out in that. And so I thought that was just interesting, was that in that I felt like there was just a lot of people being like, oh, yes, clearly the hero in that is your husband. And I was like, honestly, I don't feel like he's as much in this as it's a conversation between, like, two halves of myself. I mean, like, clearly, like, there's elements of my life that appear in all books, but really, it felt like it was like two halves of me. That because makes sense. It's not I, I actually agree with that. It's not incest if you fuck yourself. <laughs> <Am I right? laughs> uh, okay. So do you have any favorite books or shows or movies that feature this trope? I mean, hands down, TV, Roy Kent in Ted Lasso as the grumpiest grump to ever grump and then turn into a marshmallow by the end. Um, and Keely Jones, who is the brightest ray of sunshine. And if you haven't watched Ted Lasso, um, then I just, you know, basically spoiled season two for you. Um, but that's fine. Cause there's a love triangle with Keely and Roy and Jamie Tot. Remember that baby here hasn't seen it. Huh? I know. That's what I'm saying. Like I just spoiled but it's okay. There's a love triangle. So there's people dating each other. She'll forget by the time she ever watches it. If she does. Oh yeah. So I'm not what, even paying attention right now. I just oh, downloaded yeah. Hulu. I just downloaded Hulu. So I'm like ready to go. Finally. It's not on Hulu. Apple. No. It's on Apple. Oh, well, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was on Hulu. No. Oh God. Okay. It's on Apple. It's on Apple. Okay. So sorry. anyway, um, yeah, he's a, he's a great he's a great grumpy and she's a super sunshiny character. Um and it's super fun to watch. Um and as far as like books, um a good book one, uh, I'm going to go with a contemporary one. I have a few things written down here, but because it kind of reminded me of the book that I just talked about of mine, which is um Beach Read by Emily Henry. Mm. Um and cuz Beach Read by Emily Henry and by the way, I'm not at all like comparing ours and, or anything like that. Like we wrote them at two totally different times, but similar theme going on is Beach Read, if you haven't read it, has um, January and Augustus and they are both writers and they're both renting beach houses next door to each other. And January is a romance writer and she believes, you know, in the HEA, but she's kind of blocked because she had some tragedy in her life. And Gus writes like bleak literary fiction, right? And doesn't, it's like, why do things have to end happily and is not into all that? And so they challenge each other to write like the other. And so he's like, I challenge you to write a book that you think is good that doesn't have an HEA. And she challenged him to write a book with a happily ever after. Um, and it was fun because he, I mean, like he's dark and he's broody and he disappears and you don't know what's going on. And um, she's not like super sunshine because she is dealing with like the death of a parent and, and you know, what happened with all that, but she definitely is all about the happily ever after and why can't, you know, books be happy like that. And so it was a, a fun pairing. I like that. And I like, mm -hmm. I like things that have like writerly stuff to them as well, which is why I love all of them. Emily Henry's books. Cause there's 
quite a few that have writer aspects to them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so I am going to rec, I've recommended Tessa Bailey before, but I'm going to recommend Worked Up by Tessa Bailey, which I honestly think has my top favorite grumpy versus sunshine trope, like for real, it's delicious. So the heroine, his name, or I'm sorry, the hero, his name is Duke. And he is like just a factory worker that just wants to watch Sports Center in peace. Like that's literally... All he wants to do is be alone, away from his, like, four meddling sisters. He doesn't, like, talk a lot. He's massive. He just wants to be alone. And then this children's book illustrator heroine basically comes, like, crashing into his life. And he doesn't understand. He, like, (laughs) doesn't understand why he wants to be around her. He just knows he wants to be around her and he wants to make her life better. And he'll basically do anything to do it, but it takes him a long time to realize it's because he's like in love with her and he wants her. And it is amazing. It's funny, very funny. His like older sisters, the way they meddle in his life is like hysterical because he's just like over it. And yeah, it's just a delightful book. One of my favorite, I actually have a signed copy of it because that's how much I like it. I got Tessa to sign a signed copy. So yeah, it's called Worked Up and it's by Tessa Bailey. Awesome. So, okay, for me, I'm going to go with uh, first, I'm going to go with A Wig of the Finger, but a recommendation. And this is for a show called Sanditon. And so Sanditon starred Rose Williams and Theo James. It was the show that made me fall in love with Theo James. I I love... Theo James. I hadn't so. looked at. So here's my thing with Theo James is I never watched um, Divergent. I didn't really like know much about him. He kind of looked to me like he was like generically handsome, <gasps> and so I wasn't very <gasps> interested. Like, look, I'm just saying, I just saw him right. like in the world, and then you heard his like, voice, and you were like, "Yeah." Oh, and I was like, okay. "Damn!" But he just to me, like, if I first saw him, I'm like, "You look like a." If I had to like manufacture like a cis het white handsome man like you would be somebody i'd be like yes you fit this mold so i was kind of like yes but like meh i didn't know the facets of emotion though that came with the package and that's where he got me (laughs) and so he was fucking incredible in sanditon which was on pbs or itv and he's only in the first season he takes a bow out. So Sanditon is the unfinished last novel of Jane Austen. And he plays the character of Sydney, who is essentially just kind of like this broken, shattered person who has basically like the past has taken little pity on him. And he is shredded. And he also is somebody who likes to argue, which is hot to me. Like, not argue to, like, well, actually, but to, like, debate and challenge. The heroine's quite optimistic and sunny and kind of off on a grand adventure. And it's the story of them falling in love. And I really, really love it. So I do recommend it. He is, however, only in the first um, the first season. And no, there is no H-E-A. So. <laughs> but is it good? And is he good? Yes. Yeah. Um, another one that is HEA is a book and a show, and that's Red, White, and Royal Blue. Oh, by so Nathan. good. It's a movie. It's not a show. Oh, sorry. Movie. So yeah. it's a book and a movie. And the logline should be enough to hook you, which is it is an enemies to lovers, grumpy sunshine romance between the son of the first woman U.S. president and the grandson of the King of England. So a prince. It was so good. The book and the movie were so good. Yep. Prince is grumpy. The American president's son is sunshine. And it is super fun. It's super hot. And it's just a lovely romance. And then my last shout out, I'm circling back to Jane Austen. I'm not going to belabor it, but you cannot talk about grumpy sunshine without talking about pride and prejudice. I had that down. I'm like, I'm I'm like, I'm not going to say it. It's too obvious. (laughs) <laughs> I'm gonna say it's good. It's good. I'm glad you are. Um, and here, okay, since since it's so obvious, Amy, Matthew McFadden or Colin Firth, 
who does Darcy best? You know, it's... I think that Matthew McFadden is broodier. I think so, too. So, that's my vote. I don't dislike Colin Firth at all. I mean, that was the first Darcy for me, but... Matthew, I, the Matthew McFat, the movie with him and Keira Knightley, I've watched it several times and will continue to do so. He and, wrote, it, and the and the fist, like I'm all. I was just gonna it. say. Yes. I was just gonna say. Is he there's the one a, with the fist? Yes. There, okay. There's the moment, and you just see his hand flex and unflex at her touch, and it's so he, good because it's like it's it's the dramatic irony of only the audience knowing how he really feels about her. Right. Yes, and it's like a K drama Arthur Fist. It is yet better because it's not just the fist. He's not clenching to like be enraged or something. It's the touch. Then it's like a fist, and then the fist like opens to kind of be like so much like, intensity, uh, and then fists back up again. Yeah, mm-hmm. like a flower that opens and then closes back up. He's he's so good. He's so good. Yeah, I love him as Darcy. All right. Well, we're going to get to K dramas now, but before oh. we do. Yeah. So Wait, before... did Megan do one? Did you do one? Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Yeah, you did. That's right. That you did Hessa Bailey. I'm like, "Wait, did we forget you?" Yeah. No. I got so into Mr. Darcy, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. So, now it's time for our favorite segment of the week. It's the K-pop wreck of the week. And today we have Leah. Okay, so I'm going to do neither K-pop nor a song because it's my time. And what I'm going to do is I am going to talk about a album or rep- uh, an album release by one seventh of arguably the most famous K-pop group in the world, and that is BTS. And their member, their second youngest member, Kim Tae Hyung, also known as V, dropped an album this last week, and it's called Layover. So I just want to talk a bit about Layover as a whole, because is this K-pop? It is not. And what is a layover? Basically, a layover in like a general term would be any connection between flights. So you're in the middle of go coming from somewhere, and you're going somewhere. And this is kind of that moment in between. And I think that that's a really cool concept to build an album around. And this album is really cool. And so I'm going to say that for me personally, I don't find it to be necessarily a great album. I don't find it necessarily to be the best album that I've heard of the BTS soloists. And I feel like this will be the album I may end up listening to at the end of the day the most. Because one thing that I really like about it is that it's remarkably consistent. So V is known to really be somebody who's into like the jazz classics, into vintage R&B. And Layover really plays into this like smoky yesteryear vibe that he kind of tends to embody when he shows up to do his solo work. And it really lets him do something he does very well, which is hang out at the deeper end of the register. So his voice can go quite deep and he's allowed to basically hang out there for the whole album. And the album ends up kind of sounding fairly similar. It's not that every song is exactly the same, but it's not like you turn it on and like, you know, we start off high, then we're going to take you low and then we're going to do this thing over here. And so that's why I'm saying like, in terms of greatness, like some of the other albums have shown like a bigger range of concept and musicality, whereas this one's fairly consistent. Yet, because of that very reason, I think it's why you would listen to it so much. Because you could turn it on, one of the songs is called Rainy Days, and I really think this is a great album for Autumn, because this does feel like this is a song, an album that you could turn on on a rainy autumn night, pour some wine, get under that weighted blanket, and you're just gonna kind of vibe. And it's for that, it is perfect. And I also told someone, and I think Megan from Afternoon Army actually made a Venn diagram for me on it because we thought it was funny, um, which is it's the album that you can be sad to and the album you can sex to. So you Venn diagram that and you put layover right in the middle. (laughs) You can have some sad sex. And if you really want to, yeah, you could have some sad sex. The songs are very about longing. They're about relationships that have gone off track. They're about wanting people back. 
he actually did not write these songs. They're not autobiographical. Um, he produced, uh, he worked with the producer for New Jeans to do the entire album, which is really cool. So with a company that is part of Hybe, but not, um, you know, some of the producers he's normally worked with. And a last shout out is he did music videos for, I think, all the songs except one. And in every song, there is a character featured. And that character is the same character that is featured on the cover of his album. And that is his Pomeranian Yontan. And he flew to Spain to do the music videos for this album. And he actually, because Yontan has a lot of health issues, he was able to have some intern or high level staff member find a very good stand and replica of his dog. And that dog is in all the music videos. To the point that at one point in Slow Dancing, which is one of the songs, they are coming back from a dancing party on the beach and they're going up through the mountains of Spain in a car and it's all just vibing. His dog's face is CGI'd on the side of a mountain. (laughs) And I just love that we were like, at what point was he like, this is great. I'm liking everything, but you know what would make it just that little bit better? If you put my dog's face just over there and like Mount Rushmore in. <laughs> so is, I did see his dog. Can you imagine? I thought you were going to say that like an intern was in charge of the dog. And I was like, absolutely not. You could not pay me to be in charge of, of Kim Tae Young's dog with health issues. I was like, I would be so terrified. You'd be a nervous too. wreck. Yeah. I would be a nervous wreck. No, but ARMY did have a lot of funny jokes once everyone realized that like that was not the uh, Yontan that like what happened when did he come home from Spain and there was like the welcome home cheater sign. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> um, I listened to a few songs of the album and in my opinion, I want to go to like a, like a kind of like fancy bar. Hmm. I want it playing in the background. I want a big glass of wine and I want to sit there mm-hmm. and like have casual conversation with my family and friends. I want to meet new people. Like I just want to vibe and drink a good glass of wine. To that, to that album. And that's what he wanted. And when well, it's he up, achieved it, yeah, because he talked about it and he's like, this album was about vibes. And I'm totally. like, yes, it was. And it comes and I love it. Time. Yep, well done. So good for him. Get layover. He's got his dog on the front of at least one of the albums. I bought two because I wanted to get the cover that had his dog on the front. Aww. Um, and he also is asking the company to acknowledge Jontan as the newest Hive debut. Oh, and I gosh. don't believe he's joking. Okay. Oh my god. So he I think that like he dog. would really fit with the two of you, not because I mean his dog looks it feels like a cat. Like, it's a pretty eccentric little bit. Like, it doesn't feel very dog-like. <laughs> like, this is a princess dog. <laughs> a prince among dogs. Yeah. But I feel like he could just vibe with you and your animals. Because, like, really... I would totally vibe with... Absolutely. V and his animal. He loves his dog. Yep. Okay. There should be no guilt or embarrassment in embracing the things that bring you joy. Which is why the podcasts in the Studio Afterglow Network are tailor-made for you. Discover Afternoon of Delight, where three American writers examine Korean dramas through a writer's lens. Join Afternoon of Army, a space for BTS fans over 30 looking for thought-provoking discussions and thirst-inducing content. Delve into the world of fruit with It's Bananas, where the fruit maven shares how tasting new and diverse fruits led to her self-discovery, joy, and connection. For Asian drama enthusiasts seeking answers, we bring you Afternoon to Asks, where British Chinese and Korean American hosts dive into all your Asian drama questions, including special episodes under Afternoon Asks ND, where neurodivergent straight talk and representation are prioritized, breaking down ableist perceptions. Studio Afterglow is just beginning, and we promise to keep delivering content that warms your heart and tickles your ears. Embrace your passions, find joy, and let us be your source of unabashed delight. So, but what else do we love besides dogs and V's dog? We love Grumpy Sunshine. So now we are going to talk about some dramas um, without spoilers. But if we do have to talk about a drama and, uh, you know, drop a spoiler, we'll try to say so first. Okay. So first, the classic pairing of Grumpy Sunshine or the classic pairing of Grumpy meets Sunshine is pretty gendered. 
It's most often a grumpy Sundari man meets a happy woman who breaks his shell and exposes his soft little underbelly. So for the first question, let's flip it. Are there any K-dramas that feature any other gender pairings that's not a grumpy man meets a sunshine woman? So my first thought was it's okay to not be okay. And not that the hero is super sunshiny, but the heroine, Komun Young, is so dark that she makes everyone else look like sunshine. And I loved her. Like, I thought this was so well done. Like, she was, I mean, talk about a, a heroine who takes a long, long time for the ice to melt. Um, she was fantastic. But I'm also going to toss out there a really good Grumpy Sunshine in second leads in Run On, which was the only part of Run On that I liked. <laughs> and that was where I first fell for Kang Taeyo. His character, Yi Young Hua, was like the shiniest sunshine to ever sunshine. And so he might much. As, like he might as well have sparkled like a vampire. Like that's how shiny he was. And um, Su Young's uh, So Dana was cool and composed and never showed her emotions until he started getting onto her skin. But he, I mean, like, talk about wearing your heart on your sleeve. Like, he was the best, the absolute best. But, like, the detriment, I would guess to that, guess to that is, like, he wore his heart on his sleeve and he was always, always, always this beautiful ray of sunshine until he got his heart broken. Yeah. And then he was a blubbering chicken-eating mess. Yeah, <laughs> I'm was, really glad you brought that yeah. up because that probably is one of the best examples and i can't believe i forgot about it because he's he so is sunshine so sunshine and he <laughs> the way he breaks through to her is so fantastic because she's very resistant oh that's a good one way to go um so i've talked about this before but unlock my boss is uh i still want to watch that it's so great like it really truly is a fantastic drama like so entertaining very twisty it was great and the hero is amazing. And the thing is, the hero is so down on his luck. And, like, even when times look absolutely bleak, he's like, I'll figure my way out. Like, he's just, like, a very, like, optimistic. Like, he's like, um, let's just try this. Sure, it'll work. Like, crazy harebrained plans. And she is, like, very rigid. Um, she has some, like, loss in her life. Um, has some trauma, but he and she like does not like him at first. I think she thinks he's kind of like a screwball or whatever and goofy and he doesn't take life seriously. But eventually she completely caves for him because who wouldn't? And in the midst of all this, it's like a murder mystery. Like it's just um, it's really fantastic. And then I would guess I would say Tale of the Nine Tailed is a little bit like that i would say not like the whole thing but the very beginning uh Yi dong wook as Yun is extremely happy charming uh you when know he's not killing other foxes when he's not killing other behaving <laughs> but he's just like he's so charming yes. and he like flirts with her like he you know he does like things that that he's definitely trying to charm her and she just kind of looks at him stone-faced and she obviously it's gia i mean she raised herself at nine so like <laughs> She's, her own clearly, taxes. <laughs> she's clearly not a happy person and same thing i think his like charm uh eventually breaks her down and uh i love it me show so i'm gonna go with a second lead but it's probably my favorite of the grumpy sunshine leads or one of my faves and that's we're going to reply 1988 and sun Wu and bora so we have Bora so is the neighborhood grumpy guts, high overachiever, steadier, just puts the fear of God into all beings. And someone who's the younger neighbor who just loves his Nuna. Oh, <laughs> so good. Such, that's, that? uh, that's such a good pair. Oh, my gosh. So the good. Best. The best. Oh, you know what? I forgot this one. Love Tractor. Okay. <laughs> Did anyone watch Love Tractor? Tractor? Wait. Yeah, Love Tractor. It's a BL that just came out this year. Oh, okay. No. Okay. So it's on Vicky. Guys, <laughs> Love Tractor is semi ridiculous and I love it. I cannot tell you how sunshiny uh, the one uh, the one character is. His name is Ye Chan. Ye Chan. 
he is just beyond he's just a like kind of like a simple farmer character all he wants to do is like farm and like live in his small town and take care of animals and he's always happy and he just wants to be like a good guy and the whole town loves him and then you have this kind of like grumpy artistic soul student uh come and stay at his grandfather's house his name's sonyul and he is like who is this guy i don't understand um ye chan is the one who like he he has his first confession like he's the one who confesses first and he's just he's so lovable he t- like he talks you know how they um kind of like pout talk he pout talks pretty much the entire drama mm-hmm. <laughs> and i don't even care i'm like you're adorable and he's like also this like bigger guy. Oh, I just love him. I love him so much. So yeah, I would actually say if you want a BL example, Love Tractor. Heck yeah, Grumpy vs. Sunshine the entire way. Semantic error too, I would say. I know. Grumpy I mentioned Sunshine. that. Yeah. Actually, I do have a mention of that later in this. Oh, okay. Because Sorry. I no no no. It's fine. No, you just made me. You just made me think of it. It's true. And that's also a great example. Semantic error. Um, and so I guess now we'll just go with, you know, what are your, what are some of your favorite grumpy meet sunshine in K dramas? I mean, <laughs> I'm gonna say it. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm gonna say it. Goblin. I mean, yes. <laughs> goblin. Come on. It's the grumpiest goblin. Yes. And yeah, I mean, and she's sweet in her little bow tie. <laughs> she's sweet in her little school uniform. <laughs> June Tack, always smiling, so excited to walk through a secret portal door to Canada. Like, right. so leaves. excited to so excited to be the Goblin's bride. Yeah. I, I mean, she, and she's. I mean, like the funny thing is, is she's not sunshine until she meets him, which is kind of what I love. Like, she's a shit life, mm-hmm. like a very shit life. And then, I mean, she's you know being raised by her abusive aunt and cousins, and then. She finds out that she's the goblin's bride, and she is just a ray of sunshine for her goblin. And I loved it. And he's miserable because he knows what it means for her to be the goblin's bride, and she doesn't. Um, I mean, crash landing on you, Captain Ree. And again, another thing that I love about that is Yoon Sari is not sunshine until she meets Captain Ree. Like, she's kind of a grump herself, right? Because she is the sort of... um, ostracized member of her family and um you know thinks that nobody loves her and then she you know paraglides through a tornado into north korea and is so excited to be saved by this soldier and he hides her and he's the grumpiest grump so i love that um yeah, I mean, I had a whole list of ones that I, I could talk about, but I don't want to take them all. I was just like, I'm going to put some on here so that we all make sure we hit them all. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'll jump in with two. So the first one I'm going to do is When the Camellia Blooms, oh, where we have yes. basically the most marshmallowy marshmallow hero, which is why Kong Ha Newell is like one of my forever faves. And then the heroine who has a lot of armor up. And so I would classify her. I mean, is she grumpy? Yeah, look. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, but she, she kind of is. <laughs> and so their meet cute is in a bookshop where he basically just falls for her the first moment he sees her. So she's looking at books. He sees her and basically is just like the heart eyes pop out the little heart in his chest is like a wooga wooga (laughs) she's like what the fuck has happened like basically like imagine you're somewhere and somebody just starts to like look like a real creeper and that's basically the meat cute is he's like overcome with feels and she's basically like what is happening i don't like this please get away you feel dangerous yeah um and then the other one i wanted to talk about just because i think it's fun and we haven't talked about it much in a long time is touch your heart Oh, my God. How could I have forgotten that? (gasps) Thank you, Leah. Yeah, the goblin. You know, I'm going to dovetail off goblin. And I'm going to say that here we have um, Lee Dong-uk and Yuna reuniting after goblin. And the touch your heart premise is the story of um, Yuna's character is Oyunsa, who is an out-of-work actress following a falsified drug scandal. And she's trying to make a comeback in a new drama, but is it a legal drama? 
So she has to gain field experience. So they assign her to work as um, Kwon Jun Rock's uh, attorney's secretary, who's played by Lee Dong And, you know, they fall in love. So he's a very buttoned up attorney. And she basically is like Elle Woods <laughs> coming yes. in. Yes. Yes. Pink and furriness, like ready to be like, I'm your secretary and love post-it notes and happiness. And he's mm-hmm. like, what is happening? Just do your job. Like, I do not <laughs> want to babysit you. And so that's kind of taking that forced proximity, putting it with the grumpy sunshine. And it's a recipe for success every time. My favorite part of Touch Your Heart is how she doesn't know how to transfer phone calls. So her desk her like little office is right outside his office, okay? Mm. And so she'll get the phone calls, but she doesn't know how to transfer the phone call to his phone. So she tries to take her phone and like stretch the cord and in walk. his office. That's awesome. <laughs> it's so cute because he's so baffled and she is an actress. So she's like trying to maintain this composure at all times. Like she's like, she doesn't, I mean, Oh, and then she leaves, she sees, like, heart sticky notes. She writes with this, like, fuzzy pen. Like, it's, like, and he's in his office surrounded by, like, you know, paperwork and file folders. And, oh, it's so great. Good one, Leah. Thank you for bringing that one up because we haven't talked to the, about that one in a while. You are welcome. Um, So I'm going to say healer. Thanks for leaving that one for me, guys. I loved it for you. Yeah. I'm absolutely. not even, like, I'm, just watch healer. Like, <laughs> Okay. I know, like, if you've made it this far listening to us and you haven't watched Taylor yet. I mean, what, what do you want me I'm, to do? You didn't do, I'm not a robot either. Yeah, but, oh, oh my God. That's a grumpy, I mean, I guess if a robot can be sunshine. She was pretty I mean, sunshiny as a robot. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so in Healer, he's this, like, parkour loner errand boy, and she's this, like, plucky journalist and he falls so hard for her and they knew each other as kids of course they have this like childhood connection and then i am not a robot yeah he's like this reclusive billionaire who actively avoids people like at all costs carries around a baton they call him like they call him baton because he carries around this baton to keep people away and she's this uh kind of like glass half fool um heroine who's like always manages to kind of get herself out of pickles but she's also just like a good person and a happy person and more she's pretty well adjusted believe it or not even though she's pretending to be a robot and he's not well adjusted so i mean you gotta do what you gotta do to make a buck right like yeah Um, also though also though i can't i can't i can't have a mention of i'm not a robot like another sell for that is if you ever want to see somebody wearing the worst disguise ever oh to to try (laughs) not let the love interest know it's you ludicrous i'm gonna be that for halloween (laughs) everyone's gonna have no idea why like that that vision of her like that just pops into my head every time we mention it me too so I want to throw out just one last one that's like a subversion one, which you have not seen Megan still. And literally, I don't know how, like sometimes it surprises me that there's something that you've missed that like is so much your thing. And this is my holo love. I so yes, the heroine, I know. The heroine in this is pretty grumpy and she has face blindness and she just has like a very like, you know, she's just kind of, I would say she's quiet. But what's interesting is that the hero himself is also grumpy. However, he has made a hologram of himself that is a computer model, and the hologram is nothing but sunshine. And so she can put the glasses on. She brings up the hologram, who is who she falls for originally. And Holo is like, if you wanted to have the perfect man in your life who's just there, like you come home from a hard day of work, you put on your special holo glasses and there's holo there to be like, babe, what you got? Like, I got you. Oh. And it's like a simulation, but he's like fucking lovely. Yes. <laughs> and, he's so adorable. And then she begins to, and it's I hard. fell for holo. Like, I, and I would like text like, each other and be like, I need a holo. Like, yeah. I'm never over a holo. Like he's just there when you need him and he becomes like sentient. So it's not like he just doesn't mean it. Like he means right. it too. Right. 
no, I I will watch it. Don't worry. Sometime. Um, yeah. I'm going to mention a few more. I want to mention my roommate is a Gumio because same thing. Um, you got Duck Sun from Reply 1988, and she is just a freaking ball of sunshine in this. She basically plays kind of the same character from Reply 1988. So just like transport her from 1988 and put her in like a, a Gumio's mansion <laughs> where she has to be around him all the time and she can't eat chicken or drink. And it's just, it's fantastic. Um, and then Love Between Fairy and Devil. Like, yeah. Hello. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, the Chinese drama. I mean, you got Dark Moon Supreme and then you have Lovely Happy Orchid. And it is classic, classic Grumpy versus Sunshine. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Um, I'm gonna actually say too, if you wish upon me, uh, Sue Young. Oh yeah, Sue Young in that. Uh, so in Run On, she was Grumpy, but she's the Sunshine. She is. In if you wish upon, and she's a lovely Sunshine. I mean, she's just like a good person. And uh, lifting her weights on the roof, and yeah. Yeah, and Ji chong Uk is not a happy person in any way. He just got out of prison. He's, like, on the run from, like, people hunting him down. And he's got he a has... big he's got a big sequined skull on his yeah. jacket. Like... <laughs> he has massive, massive trauma from his childhood. Yeah. And, but she, same. I mean, she, he won't eat with anyone. Remember, that's, like, a big yeah. thing, how he won't eat with anyone. And she eventually, you know, breaks him down until they're, like, friends first. Uh, it's really, it's really a lovely romance. And then the last one I'm going to say this, which we did talk about this last week, was the second lead romance in See You in My 19th Life. Uh, Leah was talking about, well, you both were, about the Pride and Prejudice fist. Uh, the second male lead in See You in My 19th Life does the fist clench all the time. Yes. The heroine is this super happy florist. I mean, she's like always surrounded by like pretty flowers. She's always wearing beautiful clothes. She's always smiling. And then you have, like, the grumpy, grumpy, like, assistant to uh, Anbo Hyun. And, oh, but, but the thing is, he, like, craves her. Like, he is in love with her. And he, like, won't let himself be with her. It's so great. Uh, so, yeah, I think those are mine. Yeah. I mean, I had a couple others that didn't get mentioned, so I'll just toss them out there. Yeah. And, um, her private life. Oh, yeah. So that's a good one. Um, I... Like, I went to that drama for um, Ryan Gold, and it paid off. Like he, like he doesn't smile for a long time. No, and like you got to earn that smile, and I love that when you have to like earn the smile from the hero. Mm. Um, and another one that we just did um, because this is my first life. Um, and I don't know, I don't know if I would consider him as much grumpy as. Um, I kind mean, of cynical. He, in yeah, a way. I mean, well, realist, like, pra yeah, practical, right? Yeah. Like, he just—it's not a matter of like happy or not happy. It is just like I'm going to live with the minimal basic needs um, because that way I won't get hurt and I won't hurt anybody else. Yeah, and it took a lot to get through that, and and that was that was good to watch. Yeah. Um, um, all right. And so I thought it'd be kind of fun to, to a answer, like, what are some K-drama scenes that you think highlight this trope well? Or like a scene that you're like, okay, this grumpy's for, this grumpy meets sunshine in this drama is like, it hit me and I like it. I feel like the one of, one of my favorites is it's kind of like memeable mm -hmm. now. Like, and I feel like I, <laughs> I have used it. <laughs> like. In, in a meme sense, and it's from Crash Landing on You. And it is, um, I think it might be the first time that you and Suri think she's going home. I'm not sure. And it's when she's, like, doling out, like, awards, like, slash gifts to Captain Ree's, like, little ducklings. It's like, you can either have, you know, like, a hug from me now, or, you know, when we meet again, you can, you know, have this. Or you can have, you know, you can have Captain Ree's TV. Um, or, you know, whatever it was. I don't know if it was a TV. He had something. I don't think it was. was it? No, he didn't have a TV, did he? It was something that he had. Yeah. Something, Val. I don't even remember. It's been so long. But anyway, she's doling out these gifts and the, these awards. And he's just, like, waiting for his turn. And 
eventually she's going to mention me because I've done all I've hidden her from, you know, like the North Korean police and whatever. Um, and she doesn't have anything for him. And so he like stomps off to his room and like sits down his, on his bed and he's like in his full like army uniform <laughs> and just like sits against his headboard and pouts. With the lower and lip out. Lower lip out, like just <laughs> pout. And because she hear, he hears everybody out there, you know, like laughing and like loving everything that Yoon Suri is doing for them. And he just pouts. And I just, it, it is, it's a meme. It's a mood. I love it. And it's such a great, I mean, and what's funny is, is that like, it doesn't take, it doesn't take the entire drama for him to soften up. But like in the very beginning, he is very stoic and very much a grump and you know rightfully so because it's not safe for him to fall for her so yeah i love that that's a favorite scene yeah i i agree that's it's so great um so i'm actually going to talk about a scene from semantic error semantic error is a uh blk drama and uh park soham plays jong jae young and he's kind of like the sunshine uh he's just kind of like this charming friendly guy like everyone likes him he's popular uh and he falls for cho sang and who's played by park jay chan from uh, a k-pop group and actually they're both k-pop groups or k-pop idols and i there's the scene where they have to work together on a project uh for school they're in college and they wear these like <laughs> like American revolution costumes. You know what I mean? They have like the white wigs and when they go to return the costumes, they're in this costume shop and it had like, I don't remember all the details about like what was going on. I just remember the costume shop was closed and they, cause I think Jay Chad probably like stole them and uh, someone comes into the shop and they have to hide and they like are hiding in these like costumes and sang who like follows the rules like very carefully he's like freaking out he thinks they're gonna get caught but for uh jay young this is just like this is just fun like he's just a happy sunshine guy he's like this is thrilling and exciting and i think that was kind of the first time sang kind of like let go a little bit um kind of let himself feel like excitement let himself maybe break a little rule and it was and there was like some sexual tension in that scene too and it was because, you know, they're hiding in the dark together. Forced proximity where body parts are touching. It's no bone or alley, but, you know, it'll do. So, I don't know. I think about that scene a lot. I love it. Um, I'm trying to think of one that I want to talk about. And I'm going to go to, like, I think a very classic one as well. So, I'm going to go to Boys Over Flowers. And I am going to go to a scene which is, I think, really fun. Which is... It's when John D um, decides to rebel for the first time against the most popular boys known as F4. So Eamon Ho's character, John Pio, you know, he's just a dumb dumb, but he just cannot stop teasing John D. And in real life, we know if a boy teases you, that doesn't mean, oh, he likes you. Go out with him. But in this drama, that's the premise. And I am not sad about it. <laughs> However... He takes it too far. And what does she do? She goes into a full martial arts kick. And he figuratively and literally falls for her. As she basically just like Taekwondo chops him down onto the sidewalk. Like in the face. Doesn't yeah. she like kick him in the face? Yeah, I think so. I think like, Garden, it's like the flying kicks, gym shoe. Yeah. She kicks him in the face in Meteor Garden too. In like slow-mo yes, from thing. five different angles. Yes, because he was being a brat about her friend accidentally dropping a cake and it hit him and he was being a brat in Meteor Garden. And so she, you know, chops him down too in that one. So I like it because she, um, John Dee's very plucky. She's very sunshine embodied. And then John Pio is very grumpy. And so I like it when you see like the sunshine doesn't always just have to be like sweet and nice and like, you know, right. a wilting flower. They can also stand up for themselves. I love it. Uh, okay. And so I think we're going to close it out. Uh, so uh, with this question, Grumpy Meet Sunshine is a well-used romance trope, but it's not limited to romance. 
what are some K-dramas that utilize this trope in a non-romance pairing, such as friends, co-workers, relatives, etc.? So the first thing that came to my mind immediately, talk about like the most sunshiniest to ever sunshine, is K from Bad and Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and so K in uh, Suyol. Um, and I'm not going to give anything away because this is definitely a drama that if you haven't watched, I don't want to spoil anything. Um, but this pairing starts out as grumpy sh- sunshine and turns into a bromance. Um, mm-hmm. But I've never seen anybody shinier than Kay. I don't think in any drama. <laughs> I don't like Weeha so June. Funny. So like I didn't, I didn't know what I was in for, and I still can't get over <laughs> this character. Like it just makes me giddy to think about him. Oh God. And he's like in this. He's come. He's in the drama coming up with Ji Chang Uk, and it's like it oh, doesn't it look looks like mafia fighting. Yeah, it does not look <laughs> sunshiny at all. I mean, I will be watching, but yeah, I know it looks well. Looks him rough. and Ji Chang Uk. How do I not? Right. How do I not? Ji Chang Ji Chang Uk back in uh, action. Ugh. I hope he parkours. I know. So I feel like I'm taking this from Leah, but I just thought I should throw out the Mr. Sunshine bromance. Uh, mm. Bjorn Johan plays just very sunshine, I guess, Seguk journalist, I guess you can call him. Uh, he's definitely a, um, just a... I mean, obviously his sunshine is hiding not sunshine i mean inside well, yeah, i mean that's hurting. true i think that's true of a lot of sunshines true. right like not every sunshine is truly just sunshine down to the core like you're you're masking yeah. something but the scenes where he's drinking with dong may <laughs> and eugene in uh in the bar is, is so funny because he's so happy and he's sitting with these like two grumps and it's just i love it so much um and I would also say the Alchemy of Souls uh, romance. Yeah, you have uh, Dongu, who is just, I mean, he's just so kind of, like, happy and, like, goofy. With his, like, blonde hair and his earrings. But he's just so happy and he's so I was nice. like, that is a character who is sunshine through and through. Like, he's not oh, masking absolutely. anything. Like, he's just sunshine. And then he has to deal with brooding jong Uk and wounded, pathetic so Yul for, like, <laughs> the end. For two seasons, like, I just feel bad for him. But, uh, I mean, I love that. And anytime you can play that, obviously that uh, Sunshine versus, you know, Grumpy, even in a friendship, is a lot of fun. Um, Because I would also say the the hit-the-spot friendship was like that a little bit. You kind of had, like, one, like, reserved, quiet friend. And then you had this, like, loud, boisterous, outgoing um, like liberal friend that got her to come out of her shell through like the course of the drama. And I really like that too. Um, okay. So I am going to talk about two. The first is be melodramatic. So be melodramatic is fun because I feel like there's quite a, there's, it's about essentially roommates. It's an ensemble cast and three of the main protagonists are females who all work in entertainment. So one is an aspiring writer and she is lovely and fun and her dream is to get her own script produced. One is really trying to balance being a single mom. And so like they all live together, which makes it fun. And she also is trying to be the head of marketing at an ad agency. So you know what that means? It means like promo, like in the, in the shows and like trying to get your stuff like shown and making sure that like you're holding people accountable to like use the merchandise. And then what's also fun in this one is that there's also another close friend who is male who lives with them as well. And he is also a music producer in dramas and he is gay. He also has a relationship with his boyfriend that's shown actively and it's not a big deal. Basically he's just like incidentally gay and living his life with his boyfriend and one of their roomies. The grumpy in the group is um, a documentarian whose life has basically come to a halt after the loss of the love of her life. And so she, it's kind of like, so there's a lot of humor and fun that happens, but in the middle of it is there's a lot of grief with one character that they're trying to kind of help and, and give space to, and also try to, you know, support her in her healing. 
And so it's not a heavy drama. It's not a dark drama. It's quite fun and light, but there is a lot of emotion that happens in the drama as well. And then one other I'm just going to toss out to is Squid Game. Because I wanted to talk about the friendship between Song Wu, the villain, and Ali, who oh. is very sunshine. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. Okay. And Squid Game is not a place to be the sunshine. <laughs> no, no, it's so not. Like, the most famous last words. Young. Mm. <laughs> oh, 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 it's rough it is rough <laughs> way to <laughs> way on a, a good note on a good note to end on what a note to end on you jerk no i'm just kidding no, no that's good it's good yeah it's true and then you just hear the, the gun <laughs> yeah just hear the gun oh god <sighs> so on that note grumpy sunshine yeah, I mean... yay well, we hope you liked hearing about all the dramas that we love, but we want to hear your favorite Grumpy versus Sunshine. So tell us on Instagram and all that business. And yes. Yeah. And we're going to do more trope talks. I think for a while we've just gotten back into like really loving tropes. So we'll pick another trope to do next month and kind of figure out different ways that that showed up throughout the drama lands. Yeah, and feel free always to, like, recommend a trope you want us to cover, because we'll be more than happy. Because we love all the tropes. We yep. do. Yeah. Well, all right. I'm sorry that we don't have sunshine to end on here. You know what? It's sunshine because we get to be here with all of you today. So that's our sunshine. Thank you all for listening, and we will see you next time. Anya. 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 Kamsamnida. Thank you for listening to Afternoon of Delight. Where can you find us outside the pod? Head on over to AfternoonOfDelight.com. That's A-F-T-E-R-N-O-O-N-A-D-E-L-I-G-H-T dot com. You'll find links to all our social media, our book recs, K-pop and K-skincare recs, and if you want even more Afternoon of Delight, because really who doesn't, you can join our Patreon, where you can choose the patron level that's right for you. Join in daily K-drama conversations, listen to bonus podcast episodes just for patrons, and participate in our monthly live K-drama support group via Zoom. We can't wait for you to be a part of the community. Until next time, annyeong!